Good morning and welcome to Hillside. Happy Palm Sunday. We are so excited that you are here. We have faces in the room, which is absolutely amazing. Welcome. There is no lack of hope in this season. Not only are we a week away from Easter, but our world is coming back alive again, and there's a, new, there's a newness that's in the air, and I am so excited about what's ahead. And the biggest news of all is this is um, Pastor Seitz's first Sunday with us. So welcome, Seitz family. His office is no longer a cave of nothingness. There's life and light, and it's been an amazing week with, with you. Okay, so my favorite uh, electronic device that I'm addicted to could be yours too. Take that out. Rather, if you're here or at home, go ahead and get into the Church Center app and log your, check yourself in so that we know that you are with us. And um, I'm going to turn on over to the worship team, and um, we'll see you in a little bit. All right. It is so nice to see your faces, half of them. Welcome. Welcome to worship. Welcome. Welcome. It is so, so good to see you. You have no idea. It is so, so good to see you. Uh, We've been having some technical difficulties today. Check this out. We were wondering how much of the cross and the palm fronds are we going to be able to show today. And then it turns out the projector is not working. So I feel like it's God's answer to us looking at the cross today. So, at least this is my explanation, okay? All right, let's all stand together. We're going to sing a lot of Hosanna songs today. So follow along as much as you're able. Praise it, rising, eyes are turning to We turn to you, hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you, we long for you, cause when we see you we find strength to face the day. Your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Returning to you, we turn to you. In your kingdom, broken hearts are made new. You make us new, you make us new. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus.
Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Listen to these words from, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he, that they had seen. When was the last time you praised God with a loud voice, loud, mighty voice? saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, let's try that. Come on. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So turn to your neighbor and say, I don't want the stones to take my place. <laughs> All right. with fire, whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes, yeah, yeah. I see his love and mercy washing over all our sins, the people sing. The people sing. Here we go. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna in the highest. I see 
a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith with selfless faith I see a near revival oh stirring as we pray and seek we're on Save us, save us from ourselves, from our sins. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for coming, for dying on the cross. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. May Amen. You may be seated. I was thinking this morning about... Um, your generosity, um, how many people we were able to care for this last year. And I, I was really overwhelmed with um, how you showed up um, and loved on our community. I mean, thousands of dollars we were able to spend on people in need in our own community just because you gave. And I just, again, just want to say thank you for just showing up in the, all the ways that you did this past year. It's pretty unbelievable. Um, which really leads me to the time in our morning where we get to give back. Um, there's still several ways to do it. You can do it on your phone through our uh, Church Center app. You can drop off a check in that box. You can mail one in your convenience. And um, if you would just join me in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your people. Thank you that you, you came and that you move and you work through us. Thank you for the call that you have um, 
that you have given to us and the people who have ears to hear you. Lord, in the ways they have prayed, in the ways that they have labored for each other, the way that they've grieved for each other, and the way that they've supported each other. May we use every ounce that you give us back, in a, back to you in a way that is worthy, that continues to care for your people and your kingdom. And we just say thank you. Thank you for your provision this past year. And thank you for the provision that you will provide this year. We are just so grateful to you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite up Matt McGinnis, our council chair, and the entire Sites family of Allison and Joshua and Andrew and Pastor Dan. And staff, if you could come up and join us as well, that would be wonderful. All right. Get in here so people on camera can see you. Maybe uh, over here. So you're looking that way. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe okay. I'll try not to breathe on you. <laughs> All right. So as we know, there are still many, many difficulties going on in our world and in our community, but today we have a few things that we can truly say that we celebrate. Uh, the start of Holy Week, uh, the first time that we've seen a large group of people in this sanctuary an entire year. It feels good to be here. And, and of course, uh, the first Sunday officially for the Seitz family to be here. So welcome. We have, uh, yeah. We have, we, I think you all know Dan um, one way or the other a little bit. You've seen him, but we also have Allison and Joshua and Andrew with us, the whole family up here. So welcome to our community, welcome to Hillside, and we look forward to getting to know all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm speaking this morning in my role uh, on council, but over the course of the past year, I also served on the pastor search team. Uh, and so I just want to say thank you um, in my role as council chair to the pastor search team. <laughs> <laughs> Um, led by Jenny LaSalle, uh, who did just a phenomenal job, but um, I, was, I was honored to serve alongside um, Dave Singh, Frank Canova, Beth Aylard, Lynn Fishback, Tyler Watson, and Gloria Davidson and well, as well. And as we did that, there were so many things that we had to consider um, Dan's uh, fit for the church and education and background and experience and many, many, many things. Um, but overall, the, the overarching thing that we as a search team felt was that we discerned that God's will was for Dan and his family to be here. And I believe Dan also felt that, that same discernment that Hillside was the right place for he and his family. So that is a, a, a great uh, synergy. I think we're in alignment with God's will on this one, and we just want to welcome you here to our community. So if I can just order, offer a short prayer um, over you and your family, I'd appreciate that. Ah, holy God, your name is worthy to be praised and we praise you here today. Thank you for bringing Dan and his family here to Hillside. Uh, we ask that you just walk with us and with him and with his family as we go into this new chapter in Hillside's history. We pray that we have time to get to know him, that he can make connections with everyone in the congregation. That's a tall order. There are many of us, uh, and it will take some time, but, uh, but we know that you can make, make a way there. We just pray that you bless 
hillside through Dan, through his family, and at the same time that we all remember that this is the church of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is your church, and Dan, as well as all of us, are here to serve you. So thank you, and uh, we just ask that you walk with us into our next chapter. Amen. Amen. Um, Dan, we also have uh, a little gift for you here, uh, for you and the whole family. Here, I'll give it to the kids. You guys, you guys hold on to this. We've got uh, a variety of things in here. Um, I believe it is mostly consisted of uh, gift certificates to local restaurants that folks uh, here enjoy. And there's some notes in there about uh, why they might enjoy them. So you'll see. So hopefully uh, over the course of the next year or so, you get a chance to sample some of our, our local favorites here. So uh, please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I was just saying to the boys, cool, cool guys wear shoes like this. All right. Praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Yeah. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Yeah, come on. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Come on. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hall oh, hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. Come on now, welcome Pastor Dan. Oh. Come on now, come on. Woo! 
Oh, that's... Oh, that is very kind. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that means an immense amount. Thank you. Oh. Oh, good morning to you. Oh, thank you so much. What a thrill to be here with you. I don't have the words. What a joy. Today is an exciting morning for a lot of reasons. Uh, but most of all, it is an exciting morning because today we are joining with millions of other Christians, our brothers and sisters from every corner of the globe who are remembering and celebrating the entry of King Jesus into Jerusalem on the very first Holy Week, the most important week in history, the week that would end with Jesus dying on a cross rising again, and thereby redirecting the entire course of the cosmos. And as we remember that coming, we naturally think ahead to a day when that same king will come again. This time not to suffer and die, but to be universally celebrated and to bring permanent peace and prosperity, not least of all to the poor and to people who are victims of violence. Our passage for the morning is Mark 10, 46 through 52, which contains an incredible story, one of my favorites, of something that Jesus really did. It's, it's moving, it's funny at parts, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. So let's dig right in. Before we do, some of you might be asking, you know, why Mark chapter 10 and not Mark chapter 11 on Palm Sunday? Mark chapter 11 is the chapter that actually recounts Jesus riding into the royal city. And here's why. Because I believe that Mark wanted this episode that we're looking at today, uh, this episode of Jesus' final recorded healing, to frame our vision of Jesus as king. In other words, I think that Mark wanted this particular story to be the backdrop, the scrim, the stage set for this pivotal act in Jesus' life. Now, why do I think that? Here's the reason. In the book of Zechariah, written over 500 years before Jesus was born, the prophet announced that someday Yahweh himself would return to Jerusalem, to his people, to his temple, not in smoke and fire but in the form of a humble human king riding on a donkey. And at the end of that prophecy, and it's certainly one that Jesus' biographer Mark would have known, Zechariah says of this king, again, this king who would somehow mysteriously embody Yahweh's own personal return to his people after five centuries of absence. He says of that king whom we know to be Jesus, he says, how great is his goodness, how great is his beauty. In other words, the prophet was saying that, that unlike so many other kings and bosses and presidents and CEOs, this king Yahweh's king, he won't disappoint. Rather, he will be splendid. And so by placing this episode that we're looking at this morning right before Jesus' royal entry, Mark seems to be saying to us, he's saying, this event, this encounter typifies the king. It typifies his splendor. So let's get to it and see what we see. I'm going to read Mark 10, 46 through 52. It goes this way. And they came to Jericho. And as Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him telling him to be quiet. 
but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. When uh, our story picks up, Jesus, as you know, is on the final stretch of his final journey to Jerusalem. And all the way along, he has been trying to impress upon the twelve, his inner circle of disciples, that he is going to Jerusalem not to live, but to die. And this, this last stretch, the stretch between Jericho and Jerusalem, it is going to be a quad killer. You see, Jericho is 800 feet below sea level. It's the lowest city on earth. By contrast, Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level. Therefore, when our story opens, Jesus has got a hike in front of him. He's got a big uphill hike of 3,300 feet. What else should we keep in mind in terms of context? We know that when this story begins, Jesus has been under incredible emotional strain. And think about it. Over the course of this final journey... He's had conflict with the Pharisees. He's had conflict with Peter, who in a a, a bizarre, momentary, satanic takeover, had tried to get Jesus to abandon his calling. He's had tension with the Twelve over their just unseemly jockeying for power. He's had more tension with the Twelve over their shaming of parents who brought their children to Jesus, wanting Jesus to bless them. In short, nothing about Jesus' career and nothing about this final stretch to Jerusalem has been easy. It's been a grind through and through. Last uh, October, my wife Allison and my twin brother Darren and uh, my sister-in-law Becky and I, we, we hiked from the valley floor in Yosemite to the top of Sentinel Dome. And uh, it was a, just a fantastic day. It was a birthday celebration, and it was wonderful, even despite all the smoke from nearby fires. But the point is this. That Sentinel Dome hike is a killer, and it involves 3,500 feet of vertical gain, about the same gain as the walk from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now, we had uh, good gear, plenty of water, or, or, or pockets loaded with Kit Kat bars and Twixes, all right? But even so, it was a grind. It's a lot of work. Well, imagine knowing that you had a climb like that ahead of you under the excruciating emotional circumstances that Jesus was experiencing. You know, whereas we climb for fun, uh, with friends, with a uh, delicious pizza dinner back in Mariposa to look forward to, Jesus' post-hike dinner would be denunciation and death. And he knows it. Well, Mark tells us that as Jesus is leaving town with the twelve and this large, raucous crowd that's following, a blind beggar is sitting by the road. And uh, Mark identifies him with specificity. He's Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And he's sitting there in the heat and the dust, and he's probably got his cloak splayed out in front of him as a way of collecting coins. And Mark tells us that when Bartimaeus hears that Jesus is walking by, he begins to cry out to him, asking for mercy. And what's interesting is that the picture that Mark points here becomes even more vivid when we compare the Greek word translated cry out here with that same word used in other places in Mark. It's the word krazo. And get this, the fuller definition is this, to make a vehement outcry, to scream or to shriek. Isn't that interesting? Earlier in Mark, Mark uses that same verb, crazo, to describe the ear-splitting shrieks of that guy possessed by demons, guy who had been haunting the local cemetery uh, and cutting himself with stones until Jesus healed him. And the point is that this beggar here by the road on this morning of great 
emotional intensity for Jesus is making a ruckus. And there's, there's nothing polite or restrained or decorous about the way he's crying for help. He's calling out to Jesus with this mad furor, and he doesn't care a bit about what the crowd thinks of him. Well, the crowd of rowdies don't like his yelling. Basically, they tell him to shut up. But nevertheless, Bartimaeus doesn't care. He won't stop. And Mark says that he cries out all the more. Verse 49, the plot thickens. Hearing this man shrieking wildly like a human howler. In a famous fantasy series some of you might be familiar with, Jesus stops. He stands still, which is what the Greek word in verse 49 literally means. And of course, we wonder, is he going to get mad? Remember, he's physically and emotionally spent. He's got to be. And therefore, we wonder, is he going to unload on this guy, this loudmouth who won't stop screaming? And, and no, he won't. Instead, in a, a subtle rebuke of the rebukers, Jesus commands the crowd to call the man to him, which they do. Now, this is interesting and something to notice. It's interesting that just like the beggar, Jesus resists the pressure of the crowd. Think about it. In, in rebuking Bartimaeus, what is the crowd doing? The crowd is implicitly bossing Jesus. It's as if they're saying, Jesus, don't disappoint us. Stay on your kingly course. Do your kingly thing. Everyone is depending upon you. Don't waste time on this loser. But what does Jesus do? He stops. He stops anyway. He won't cave into the pressure. And he does the completely countercultural thing that the Father would have him do, which is to help this desperate man. And next we get a surprise. Man springs up, and what happens? Jesus doesn't heal him. Jesus doesn't heal him, at least immediately. Instead, he asks a respectful question. Verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? And if we read imaginatively, we can just kind of see the crowd here. Probably now more exasperated than ever. You know, Jesus, isn't it obvious what he wants? He's blind. He wants to see. You know, what do you think he wants? Golf clubs? You know, a jet ski? Instapot? But again, Jesus won't be cowed. He won't be pushed off course. And this means that he won't deny the man. Disadvantaged as he is, agency and dignity. Rather, he treats him as someone who, despite his circumstances, despite his disadvantages, is able to make choices, is able to take action, is someone who can retain responsibility for his own life. Well, after receiving the man's answer, Rabbi, I want to see Jesus heals him, and he follows Jesus down the road. You know, what, what a picture of our splendid king, the king whom we're celebrating this morning. And I think that there really are many ways in which this story highlights Jesus' particular splendor. But for me, two really stand out. And I want to draw them uh, out for you. The first one is this. His pressure cooker self-control. Think about it. Again, we've got to assume that Jesus is exhausted He's physically and emotionally spent, and what's more, his prospects are um, incredibly grim, at least the near-term prospects. Him coming up quick on his calendar is a date with a Roman cross, and Jesus knows it. And nevertheless, when Bartimaeus calls out to him asking for help, he gives it. He's able to draw strength from his well, a, a deep well dug over many years of the closest possible connection with his father, and he's able to love the man. Think about it. Think about the circumstances. He doesn't explode, and neither does he heal in a begrudging fashion, you know, firing off power just to silence the guy. Rather, he stops. He stands still. And ignoring the chorus of voices, telling him to blow off this guy, he treats him with dignity 
And even more as something precious, engaging him in conversation, asking him what it is that he wants, what it is that they can do together, as John Stott puts it. And friends, that King Jesus is splendid in this particular way is good news for us because it means that we who belong to him, we can exemplify this same kind of humanity as well. We can live with a regal self-control that makes God look good and which blesses other people. Think about it. The essence of Christianity is unity with Jesus. It's being forgiven by him and then connected to him in a permanent union. It's dying with him and rising with him. And then it's living that new spiritual reality, that new permanent connection of mind and heart where we get the benefit of his own mind and heart and person. And that means something very good and very practical. It means that none of us who belongs to Jesus has to be a hothead, losing control over every provocation or indignity, big or small, doing damage to ourselves and our relationships and our reputation and others. None of us has to be a slave to every impulse, to every inclination. Rather, joined to our splendid King, we're free And we're empowered to live lives, among other things, of splendid self-control, genuine humanness in our families and in our workplaces. In fact, I'm sure that this week, some of you, maybe in this room, maybe watching on the screen, you show just that kind of splendid Jesus-like self-control in extreme pressure. I bet you did. Self-control that wasn't possible for you before you sank with Jesus and resurfaced with him in baptism. Maybe you were, say, at a Zoom meeting this past week, and one of your colleagues said something disparaging about you right in front of your team. And at that moment, you felt your anger rising as your reputation was threatened, and you felt ready to unload on that person for the slight. But then... You found yourself responding in an entirely different way from an entirely deeper source with a gracious word, a wise one rather than a defensive one. And as you did, the whole temperature of the meeting dropped 10 degrees with your coworkers direct messaging you afterwards, giving you props for your grace under fire. That's what this first feature of King Jesus' splendor, his pressure cooker self-control makes possible for us who belong to him by faith. You know, I said that two aspects of our King's splendor jump out at me in this story. Here's the second one. His program pausing personal concern. Think about this. Jesus has a large-scale calling. He has a cosmic calling, and that's to get to Jerusalem and then to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world, and in so doing, to reconstitute the very nature of creation, which is what we as Christians believe happened after Jesus died and rose again. The world became a different place. And again, Jesus is Israel's Messiah. He's the Son of Man, and he understands himself to be such. He knows what he's called to do. He's the one whose life mission is to fulfill the Father's century-long plan to save the world through his special nation. And nevertheless, that large-scale mission, that cosmic calling, it didn't keep him from responding to individual cries. And when Jesus hears Bartimaeus' desperate shrieking, he stops He stands still. And then treating the man as someone of infinite worth, not as a speed bump to get over before he gets to the really important work, he engages him in conversation. And then he heals him. And then, after giving attention to this individual cry, what does he do? He gets back on the road. Recently, I read about a guy, a real guy, who exemplified this particular aspect of King Jesus' splendor. His name is David Ruggles, and he really inspired me. And he's someone whom I want to be like, and, and 
not least of all in my pastoral role here. Let me tell you about David Ruggles. In, in addition to running a bookstore, Muggles, who was from a very strong Christian family, was an officer in an abolitionist organization based in New York. And one of his roles in this organization was to go to dangerous corners of the city where slaves were being locked away and inform them of the state law that held that after nine months of residency in New York City, they were free. You can think of David Ruggles as the prototype for somebody like Gary Haugen, uh, the founder of International Justice Mission. And Ruggles was constantly at risk of kidnapping. He was physically beaten several times. He even had his bookstore burned down for his work. But here's the part of the story that really struck me. In October of 1838, Ruggles is working at his desk and he receives a note from somebody in his network saying that an escaped slave has shown up in the city and needs a place to stay. Well, what does Ruggles do when he gets this opportunity? This busy guy with a big calling, who we must assume is, is emotionally and physically taxed. Does he tell this contact of, to find somebody else to help with a fugitive? Does he say politely or impolitely that his job is to write the articles, edit the journal, set the policy? Does he add that just now he's absorbed in a court case involving another fugitive slave, which he was, and to go talk to somebody else? No, no, no. Instead, Ruggles heads out personally to the docks in the dark of night to find this fugitive, which he does, and then he invites him to stay in his own home. And almost immediately after seeing that this man gets a good meal, Ruggles learns that this fugitive's fiance is back in Baltimore. So Ruggles says, hey, send for her. Bring her up. Well, after she arrives and realizing this couple has no pastor, Ruggles calls his own pastor and he asks if he would perform this couple's wedding. Here's the icing on the wedding cake of this story. Before the newlyweds head off for their honeymoon, David Ruggles, not a wealthy guy, hands them a $5 bill as a wedding gift. What King Jesus-like love. And even more specifically, what program pausing personal concern. Here's the punchline. Do you know who the fugitive slave whom Ruggle shelters from slave catchers and feeds and finds a wedding officiant for? I bet you can guess. Frederick Douglass. And imagine how the world would be different without Frederick Douglas, think about his singular contribution. And yet, without David Ruggles taking him in, pausing the large-scale work for the small, Frederick Douglas might never have become Frederick Douglas. Without David Ruggles, Frederick Douglas might have been tackled, shackled, sold to the Deep South, never to be heard from again, which proves that sometimes our most lasting large-scale work is actually our small-scale work. This aspect of the king's splendor, it holds promise for us in another way as well. It shows that we who belong to Jesus, we can bring the big and the small together, the programmatic and the personal, again, because Jesus did, and we belong to him. And this encourages me because this is, candidly, the kind of pastoral leadership I aspire to offer you here at Hillside. This is my first real Sunday, so maybe it's okay to take a minute to talk about this. You know, like King Jesus, I want to stay focused on the big mission. And for us here at Hillside, that mission is to be light in the world. And I want to work with our superb staff and our wise council and so many wonderful lay leaders to create systems that will allow us here to bring many, many people into Christ's body by faith, into the Hillside family, and I want to work at systems that will polish them into beautiful, beaming bulbs. I want to build systems that shape our hillside kids and the friends that they bring to live joyfully and loyally their whole lives. And to do that is going to require me to be very disciplined with time, which I intend to do. 
But at the same time, I want to offer you pastoral leadership that looks like Jesus here. That treats every one of you and every staff member, every community member at Hillside as someone of infinite worth. Whose personal needs are as important as the grand programmatic ones. You know, our king brought together the big and the small. The programmatic and the personal. He wasn't too busy to spend time with Bartimaeus to give him meaningful time and attention. But at the same time, after giving Bartimaeus the love he needed, what did he do? He kept heading for Jerusalem to work at his cosmic call, to die on the cross, to end the tyranny of sin over the earth. And that's what I want to do. Being faithful to the large-scale responsibilities of a senior pastor in a big church in extraordinarily complex times, but never at the expense of the small. To bring them together in splendid harmony like our splendid king did. And you know what? That's what I want for you as well. Because God has given you an important calling too. One that will require of you deft balancing of the big and the small. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son, our king. And thank you for his particular splendor. Thank you for what he accomplished for us 2,000 years ago on a cross at the end of Holy Week. And Father, this week we want to pattern ourselves after him, the one to whom we are joined in loving union, in the way that we walk, in the way that we stand still for the Bartimaeuses around us, and in the way we stay committed to whatever large-scale creation-shaping work you've called us to do inside and outside our church. We love you. We pray in the name of our King. Amen. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sing. Through pillared court and temple, the lovely anthem rang. To Jesus who had blessed them, close folded to his breast. The children sang their praises, the simplest and the best. From Olivet they followed, mid an exalted crowd. The victor palm branch waving, enchanting clear and loud. The Lord of earth and heaven rose. Scorn that little children should on his bidding wait. Hosanna in the highest, that ancient song we sing. For Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven our king oh may we ever praise him with heart and life and voice and in his blissful presence eternally rejoice Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Come on, lift up your house, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say, rejoice. The Lord our Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When He has purged our stains, He took His 
see above lift up your heart lift up your voice rejoice again i say rejoice his kingdom cannot fail he rules over earth and hell the keys of death and hell are to our jesus again lift up your heart lift up your voice rejoice again i say rejoice Rejoice in glorious hope, our Lord the Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. Say, rejoice. Amen. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide Trembles at his voice and Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me How great is our God and all will see how great, how great is our God. Sing age to age, come on. Sing age to age, we stand. And time is in His hands, beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, say, Father, Spirit, Son. The Lion and the Lamb. The Lion and the Lamb. Sing it out. Come on. Say, How great is our God. Oh, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Oh, name above all names, and He's worthy of, and He's worthy. our God. How great. It's a name above all names, yeah, and it's worthy of all praise. Oh, my heart will sing how great is our God. God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great 
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How about just the church? One more time, sing. How is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great. How great is our God. Amen. What a king we have. Yes. What a king we have. May this holy week be one in which you live in great confidence in your king, enjoying his favor which you have, marveling at his faithfulness, Refusing to fret too much over evil, like the psalmist, Psalm 37 says. And seeking to follow him in the power of the Spirit. See you this Friday for our Good Friday service. God bless you and go in peace.